Hey everyone, when Fujifilm dropped off the X-H1 for me a few weeks ago, they said that this camera was basically the X-T2 with a bunch of improvements in the video functionality. And while there are some other enhancements to the camera as well, I'm pretty sure it was designed to take a chip out of the market share that is dominated by the Sony a7S II and the Panasonic GH5. Now, at the time I had that camera, I did not have access to the GH5S, nor did I have access to the a7R III. And I know a lot of you would be really interested to see how the camera stacks up against those, but I still think it's really important to test it against the a7S II and the GH5 because those cameras are really becoming workhorses in mirrorless production. And this has got to show that it can stand up to those. So there's a couple things that I wanted to test for, and this is what we did. We looked at dynamic range. I want to go into the footage and see the quality of it both in log and hyper gamma picture profiles. We took a deep dive into DaVinci Resolve to see what the footage could do on the back end. I also of course wanted to test for higher ISOs, things like autofocus, the stability, all cameras feature an IBIS image stabilization, and then we looked at high frame rates, just the quality of the footage at the high frame rates, and finally I want to just look at the designs of the cameras and how they are to work with and to use. So without further ado, let's dive in and first take a look at picture quality. Oh wait, wait, one more thing. As with all my comparison and review videos, I have to leave with this caveat, which is that I use these cameras in the settings that I'm most used to and comfortable with. So you may use them slightly different than me and get different results. As well, I don't have a calibrated production monitor, as you can see, and you probably don't either. So results may vary. Uh, it's important that you look at my experience as an insight and extrapolate from that how it affects you, not as the gospel according to Dale. Agreed? Internet trolls, you've been warned. Let's do this. We got a lot of info to plow through. Yes, yes, it's all well and good that the cameras can shoot in a log picture profile, but log often creates more problems than it solves, and there's a time and a place for everything, and that's why I think hypergammas are the better choice for most video work. They exist in the world between log and Rec. 709. They are often better in the shadows, and they are better often in low light as well. And they still have a surprising amount of latitude in post, so I've taken my three favorite profiles and examined those within Resolve to see how they perform. So let's take a look. I shot a scene that is as close to dog shit lighting as you could possibly get, in front of a window without any fill or key light. I also intentionally underexposed my one stop to protect some of the highlights. Can I make this look good? Let's find out. Starting with the X-H1, it has the brand new Eterna picture profile replicating the Eterna motion picture film stock. As I said in our X-H1 review video, I am super impressed with this profile. It has great latitude and color. When I bring it into Resolve to boost the shadows, it comes out pretty nice and even got some highlight detail back. Though in the process, I did kind of ruin the highlight detail on my face, but I could probably get that back if I had a little bit more time and tweaking and maybe if I knew what I was doing. Moving on to the GH5. Ever since the GH4, I've typically used the Cine D profile. It does have the most amount of shadow detail, but the highlights are still quite blown out. The issue with Cine D to me is always that the midtones seem quite milky and there's a lot of toxic orange color as well in the color profile. This might mean that I'm going to start maybe using the Cine V profile setting from now on. In any case, some work in the grade pretty much cleans this up, though it does take some time to make it work. The A7S II is set to PP5 and Cine 3 color gamut. It is the most useful hyper gamma in the camera in my opinion, and I rarely use any of the other ones. However, the highlights are super clippy, and the profile shows the least amount of dynamic range of any of the three cameras. Despite that, however, I was able to tweak the exposure without roasting the skin highlights, so plus for Sony. The winner for me here is the X-H1. The Eterna Picture Profile seems to have the best dynamic range, yet requires the least amount of futzing with in post. It is a great profile straight out of the camera. Okay, moving on to log. Now there is a complex yet very solid argument on why shooting log on 8-bit cameras is a bit dubious, and that means that the GH5 with internal 10-bit should come out ahead. But we've all seen very good footage from log being shot on 8-bit mirrorless cameras. So there's clearly more to the story there. Now I want to test for two things. I both want to test for the dynamic range of the cameras, but I also want to look at how gradable it was. Two caveats though. Number one, I did not set up Resolve to be color managed. Doing so would have probably meant a better grade, but I was halfway through this whole project when I realized I didn't have it set up. So I want to keep things consistent and I don't have all the time in the world. Number two, which might be even more important, 
is while I've been using Resolve for several years now, I am not a professional colorist. So my results are that of an amateur colorist just poking around in the dark. So take that for what it is, come along with me for the ride. I process the log in two ways. One with a LUT plus some tweaking and the other a full manual within the RGB color space. First up is F-Log on the X-H1. The eternal LUT that is supplied by Fujifilm is banging. It is so good in fact that when I went to try to recreate it manually, I couldn't do it. I found the F-Log footage much more difficult to work with and actually took me longer to reel in than I'm used to. And here's another interesting thing. One-shot charts don't work well because F-Log isn't supported in Resolve at the time of this video release. So it has to all be done manually. The once it was done, I was quite content with the results and very happy with the dynamic range of F-Log. So moving on to V-Log Lite. It is the only 10-bit log signal out of all these cameras. But you need to use the Vericam 35 LUT and then tweak it a bit. There is no official V-Log Lite to Rec. 709 LUT. And here's also my issue with the GH4 or GH5 footage. Log or otherwise, the red channel colors can be bonkers. And so you've got to find ways of dialing it back. Plus, like the Cine-D profile, it feels quite muddy, albeit the least video feeling of the three cameras. And now moving on to the fan favorite S-Log3. Alistair Chapman from xdcamuser.com has a whole series of really great LUTs uh, and I use those to tweak and he also has an S-Log to film LUT which is really really nice. S-Log3 is probably as close as I've ever seen to the highlight control from the Alexa's RE Log C. But in my enthusiasm of pushing this thing around, I kind of pushed it a little too far and got some artifacts in the pillow, though that's likely my fault and not the fault of S-Log3. And the winner of the log driving contest is Sony S-Log3. But I am still not convinced that F-Log isn't quite as good, though it'd be nice to see it supported fully by Resolve. Moving on to high ISO, spoiler alert, Sony wins. Of course it does. That's the whole point of the camera. But there is a trade-off for such a feature. The camera's sensor is a 12 megapixel sensor, hardly serious photography specs. So if you want a camera that can do more than that, there is going to be a bit of a trade-off. Now, the X-H1 features a 24 megapixel APS-C sensor, and the GH5 has a 20 megapixel Micro Four Third sensor. So it's not really all about how well these cameras do in high ISO, but like how far you can push them, and then what is the trade-off that you get as far as features are concerned. So starting at 800 ISO, let's take a look. When I look at this footage, I like the X-H1 the best for its overall color profile and picture quality but I don't expect it to do amazing at the higher ISOs. Now the GH5 colors should have probably been dialed down a bit and the image is also super sharp. I probably should have turned the sharpness down in camera as well. You can actually see some of the moiré on the drapes. By comparison, the A7S is actually quite filmic and is not its usual sharp video look. At 1600, everything kind of looks the same noise-wise. So let's keep going. Now, at 3200, Sony is showing how good it is with the compact grain structure, and there is no compression artifacts or color shifts. We go to Fuji with a larger grain and some artifacting. Then the GH5 with artifacts and the largest, kind of most noticeable grain. At 6400, Sony shows no real perceivable change over 3200, which is quite impressive. The X-H1 holds up quite well. There's no real color shifts, and by comparison, the GH5 completely hits the ditch here with major color shifts and compression artifacts. And finally moving on to 12,500 ISO. Sony of course is going to win hands down here with a tight grain structure. Um, barely changed again over 6400 and there's no color shifts or compression artifacts. For a 24 megapixel sensor, the X-H1 actually holds up quite well. Like the Sony, there's no real perceivable color shifts and of course while the grain is much larger, I wouldn't say that it's unusable. In fact, if you are an event shooter, you could probably clean up a lot of this in post and come out with a pretty nice image. The GH5, well, what are you gonna say? So as I mentioned at the start, Sony of course is the overall winner, but if you're a photographer, that does put the A7S II out of contention. If you need a 24 or 20 megapixel camera, really the X-H1 is showing the best results. It's really about choosing the right camera for the right job. And the GH5, you can't even give it too much of a hard time because now they've replaced it with the GH5S if low light performance is the most important to you. So you can't make a dog run a horse race. 
Next up is autofocus, which is actually quite important now because these cameras are living on gimbals and we've come a long way with the technology where the continuous autofocus of these cameras is quite good, but we now have face and eye detection, though not all are equal in their performance. So let's go in and take a look. The X-H1 requires a bit of tweaking to get it to work well. We covered this in our main X-H1 review video with Nick Merzetti. I've posted a link in the description below, but basically it's not as responsive or as accurate as I would have hoped. But when it works, it works. The GH5 seems to be fine if you're far away, like in a mid shot, or if you fill the frame, like in a close up, but is otherwise sluggish or completely non responsive anywhere in the middle. The GH5 is known for having its autofocus issues that were attempted to be resolved in firmware updates, but still seems to be kind of suffering. And then on to Sony, snappy and accurate. By far the best autofocus performance of the three cameras, really responsive, very accurate. Next up is stability. All cameras feature internal body image stabilization, which puts the sensor on a gimbal inside of the camera, but not all results will be the same. This is just my opinion, is that with a larger sensor, it's going to be less stable than a smaller sensor. It's just kind of simple leverage. And so when we look at the footage side by side, we can see the full frame sensor of the Sony a7S II being a little less stable than the APS-C sensor of the X-H1, and then subsequently the X-H1 not quite as stable as the Micro Four Thirds sensor of the GH5. So for me, GH5 comes out the winner. And now for high frame rates, super slow motion. All three of these cameras shoot 120 frames per second at 1080p. And when you're doing high frame rate tests, what you're looking for is typically two things, moire as well as some compression artifacts. What I chose to shoot would likely never show either of those things. So in the meantime, enjoy this delicious beverage. Last but not least is button design and layout. If you've seen any of my other Fuji videos, you know that I'm a huge fan of the Fuji layout. It is simple, clean, and easy to use. When I move on to the GH5, and I've found this with the GH4 as well, a very great layout, very intuitive, but it is a bit cluttery. And so I found that to slow me down a little bit. The big win on the GH5 for me is the flip out and rotatable screen, which makes it really the only choice for bloggers if you don't want to use a monitor, and it just makes it a little bit more versatile in a variety of shooting situations. Then I move on to Sony, and if you've watched enough of my videos, you will know that I'm not the biggest fan of the Sony layout. Everything is in weird places, there's a lot of buttons, things are hidden under menus, it just doesn't feel very intuitive. I've been shooting with Sony cameras for quite a few years and I never totally get used to them, but if I am shooting with them for a longer period of time, I do kind of adapt and it becomes less of an issue. It's more an issue when you're going from camera system to camera system continually. If you own it and use it every day, I'd hesitate to say that this was really that big of a deal. So in conclusion, I don't want to declare an overall winner because there's way too many factors that go into what camera works best for you in what situation. But if you were following along and counting, you'll probably see where I'm going with this, that the X-H1 is actually showing to be a real competitor against these two other cameras. Now, of course, I wasn't able to test the A7R3 and the GH5S, which could very well do in the X-H1, but maybe we'll test that in the future. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching and sticking through this with me. Uh, please subscribe to our channel and find us on the web and comment in the comment section below. We'd love to know your experience with all three of these cameras and what you'd like to see in the future. Until then, Goodbye and happy shooting.